All right, everybody, 10 o'clock on this beautiful Wednesday morning. Welcome back to your favorite class. Uh, a couple of announcements. We're doing the non-circular torsion lab this week. Uh, some of you had that yesterday. The rest of you will have it tomorrow. Um, kind of some theory there about strain gauges and how they operate. Um, but generally, the lab is pretty straightforward. I think it's probably the easiest lab of all of them that you've had. So um, a little bit lighter on the lab, I guess. Uh, and it's going to be due at the beginning of uh, lab lecture next week. So uh, get that done. It's the last lab for the class. Uh, you have homework six on strain transformations and principal strains, which is due kind of right now. So um, please, I'll give you a couple minutes leniency if you want to get it in uh, in the next couple of minutes. Please do that. All right. So new topic now. We kind of um, put a cap on torsion of thin and non-circular members. So we're going to move on to a new topic. I've posted notes for that. And that's going to be on pressure vessels. So let us do that. OK, pressure vessels, RAR. All right, so pressure vessels are kind of common. You know, firefighters, apparatus, things, storing, you know, natural gas and tanker trucks, transporting gasoline and all sorts of stuff. OK, so they're very common in, in the practice. And so it's good to talk about them and what are the stresses that develop and um, designing these appropriately, understanding sort of longitudinal hoop stresses, et cetera, are going to be kind of important generally to discuss uh, moving forward. So we're first going to talk about um, thin walled pressure vessels and then we'll talk about thick walled pressure vessels. And they have kind of simplifications for thin walled structures. And we're going to talk about actually the full blown thick walled pressure vessel equations, which are a little bit more complicated, um, but generally probably what's used in most like finite element softwares and those sorts of things. So we'll start simple with thin walled vessels, and then we'll move towards uh, thick walled vessels. All right. So um, we're going to look at. Both thin walled. and thick walled pressure vessels. All right, the thin walled. The idea here usually is if you have some pressure vessel. And if we look at some cross section of some pressure vessel, let's say. Here's some cross section of some vessel. Um, and here's like this internal radius, let's call it little r, and you've got some wall thickness here that's little t. Typically, we would say that it's thin walled if t is less than or equal to 0.1 times r, so 10% of the radius. All right, that's probably an appropriate um, value for making thin walled assumptions. Okay, so t equal to 10% times r. This might be a little bit easier to understand. All right, so we'll start with thin walled, which is a little bit easier to work through. And then we'll move to thick walled. And the first thing we're going to consider is just a spherical vessel, and then we'll look at cylindrical vessels. All right, so let's first look at. Um, spherical. Vessel. So we'll assume here uh, that we have, excuse me, a thin walled vessel with a sort of an internal radius of R and a constant pressure on the inside, which is a little p. So internal radius of little r and internal pressure of little p. It's hard to like make little and big p's, but um, this is sort of little p here. Uh, spherical pressure vessels, it's kind of hard to like draw <laughs> uh, a sphere come in two dimensions. Maybe I'll do my best by sort of just like saying that this is spherical pressure vessel and kind of I'll make this dash line here is like the wall of the sphere. And a lot of times to indicate that it's spherical, you might see like this 
kind of like hoop thing around it here to indicate that it's like somehow spherical and in, in cross section. Okay, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to draw, but hopefully you get the idea there. Uh, and the internal radius here from the inside to the edge, we're calling this little r. And we're going to say that it's pressurized on the inside with some little p. Okay, so all these arrows here are sort of pressures on this internal wall. And each of these pressures we're calling like a constant value of little p, which isn't varying at all inside of there. It's, it's some constant value. Right. So we want to know like what is the stress in the walls? Um, and we're, you know, remember we talk in three dimensions. So kind of what is the three dimensional state of stress in the walls and in the edges? All right, so we're going to assume that this is thin and that'll make a make our life a little bit easier. Assume thin. Such that. Um, there's no stress on the outer um, edges. No stresses on the outer surface. OK, so we're in kind of like a state of plain stress on the outer surface. And since the walls are thin, we do not develop any shear stress in the walls. OK. If you just like thought about like a very, very, very thin plate here, uh, and you're trying to like load this thing up in shear, it's just like very hard to develop shear stress in something that's very, very thin. Think of like a piece of paper, okay? It's, if you're trying to like shear a piece of paper, it's like actually really difficult to develop like a shear stress in that piece of paper just because it's so thin. And that's kind of the assumption that we have here for these pressure vessels is it's just the walls are so thin, you can't really like shear against itself, okay? That's kind of an assumption that we're making. OK, so now we're interested in like what are the stresses that are kind of like in the wall of the cylinder or of the sphere? So let's look at. Stresses in the wall. And we're going to get these by sort of slicing through the hemisphere of the, the, the sphere. Um, and I'll say a hemispherical cut. And then after we make this cut, we'll do a force balance. All right, so what does this actually look like? All right, well, if I like take this cylindrical object and I slice through it, I might have something that looks like this. I keep saying cylindrical, I mean spherical. All right, so this is like half of my sphere that I cut through. Right. And the general idea here is that there's going to be some stresses in the walls from the cut that I've made, so sort of like the normal stresses that come from these cuts. And that's going to have to be balanced by the pressure that's sort of on the inside of the cylinder in this particular surface. So if we put a coordinate system on here that might be something like, I don't know, X, Y. Let's just put some coordinate system here. And there's going to be a stress that like develops inside of these walls. Here. Which I might call. Sigma X. Or maybe I'll call this some axial stress. It's sort of like in the walls of the cylinder. This is going to more or less have to be balanced by the pressure that's inside of the cylinder that's acting on like this internal area here. So this internal area here has got some pressure that's acting on it. And that pressure is constant. 
and we know that this pressure is equal to P. This is little p, right? So we want to like sum the forces in the x direction, which is kind of like summing the forces in the axial direction. So we want to say like A for axial. And we know that this is going to have to be zero since this thing is not really moving. It's an equilibrium. So um, the stress that's provided by the pressure or the force that's provided by the pressure is, is simply going to be this pressure here multiplied by the area over which that's particularly acting. So the force from the pressure that's going to be something like little p times a which is going to be little p times pi times the internal radius squared. All right. And then from stress and walls. You're going to have something like this axial stress acting over that thin strip of like wall material that we cut through. Okay. So this is like sigma a times area of the walls, some kind of a walls. So this is going to be sort of this circumferential length, which is like 2 pi little r, that's sort of like the circ circumference times the thickness to give me a total area multiplied by this sigma a value that we've obtained. So this is kind of the force that develops from the stress in the walls. This is the force that develops sort of on that open surface that we have to balance. So here then some of the forces in the axial direction equal to zero leads me to something like P pi r squared. That's the force from the pressure is going to be equal to 2 pi little r t times the stress in the walls. All right, you can rearrange for this to sort of solve for what the stress in the walls are. And you'll find that the stress in the walls in the actual direction, some of these r's are going to cancel, the pi's are going to cancel. It's just going to end up being uh, PR on 2T. Define some of these things for clarity's sake. R is the internal radius. Please remember that. And T, no, sorry, we'll do it this way. T is wall thickness. And this little p is the constant internal pressure. OK. So there you go. That's the stress in your walls of a thin walled cylinder. This is more or less constant, no matter how you slice the cylinder. Um, I keep saying cylinder. Stop me when I say cylinder. It's a sphere, OK? Except for when we go to the cylinder portion. Then don't stop me, OK? Um, in a sphere, kind of no matter how you slice it hemispherically, you're going to see this axial stress, all right? So you know, if I have my sphere that looks like this, whatever, there's my sphere, and I have a coordinate system that's like x, y, z. All right. Well, if I like slice plane, then sigma y will be this expression. If I slice through the x y plane, sigma z is this expression. If I slice through the x y plane, sigma z is that. You know, you get the idea. All right. 
that no matter how you sort of slice through these planes, you're going to have that same stress in all three directions, all right? All right, so then that's for thin spheres. Said it right that time. Now let's move on to thin cylinders, for real cylinders. No more messing around. Now I'm going to start saying sphere like all the time. Dang. All right. So now thin walled spheres. No, I'll just mess with you. Cylinders. <laughs> All right, basically the same idea. Some vessel, it's pressurized internally. We're going to make some cuts to look at how the stresses result. All right, <clears throat> so same idea. Uh, internal pressure. Uh, it's constant. And we'll use a little P again. And here, the picture you might want to have in your head for a cylindrical pressure vessel. Maybe do the best I can. OK, something that looks like that. And you might see it with sort of like dashed lines like this to indicate that it has some wall thickness underneath this outside surface that you can't really see. Um, but this is kind of the basic idea here, All right? This is your <coughs> cylindrical pressure vessel. If we sort of looked at a, an element on the surface here, we know we're not going to have any uh, out of plane stress. We know we're not going to have any shear stress. The only stresses we have to really worry about are this stress in this direction here, this stress in this direction here. So if you have your sort of typical coordinate system that you might call like the XY coordinate system, you might call this sigma X, you might call this sigma Y. All right, question. Is this a pill shape or a soda can shape? Uh, pill shape, those soda cans are also cylindrical pressure vessels. Rounded flat ends, irrelevant. Same sort of derivation. All right. So the nomenclature for these uh, cylindrical pressure vessels, if you have an element that sort of looks like this, is that the stress that's kind of forming in what we've drawn as the x direction, we would call the axial stress or the longitudinal stress. So you might see this as sigma axial or you might see it as sigma sub L for longitudinal, right? It's along the length of the cylinder. And sigma Y, this is often called the hoop stress. I think for obvious reasons, it's kind of like the hoop um, of the cylinder. So kind of how the stress goes around the circle. So sometimes called sigma H, and it's also sometimes called the circumferential stress. So you might see it as sigma theta. So we're going to look at each one of these kind of separately. <clears throat> OK. So let's first make a cut. You know, I mean, we can sort of cut simultaneously um, to, to look at both of these stresses. All right, so let's make some cuts. Same idea. Make cuts. And force balance. All right. The first cut we might want to do is like a, an axial cut. to sort of expose the axial stress. And that would again give us something that looks like this. We're cutting through the cylinder. And this is sort of moving back into the page. <clears throat> 
will similarly to the sphere have some stress that's moving in this direction. And that's going to be balanced by the pressure that's acting on this open face here. Okay. So we have the pressure little p. And here we have our axial stress sigma a. This cut should look very familiar. Yes. Looks just like the sphere, right? So same derivation as. And so you'll similarly have what you saw for the sphere, same for the cylinder in the axial direction. Is going to be PR on 2T. I'm not going to go through that derivation again. Hopefully you kind of understand it looks basically exactly the same as like the hemispherical cut we made in the sphere. What's different now is if we do kind of like a cut through the longitudinal section of the sphere. So the sphere, dang it, the cylinder, I was doing so good. So what about a longitudinal cut? And this is going to help us to determine our hoop stress. Hoop, there it is. This is going to look more like the following picture. Okay. Hopefully we're sort of following my picture there kind of like sliced along the long dimension of the cylinder. Right? So in this particular situation, I'm kind of interested in uh, if I have like a typical coordinate system here. I would be interested in like what's going on here. This is like my hoop stress. It's this like circumferential stress that is developed in kind of like the the walls of the cylinder sort of around the sort of around the cylinder in this direction. OK, so here this would be like sigma theta that's developed on the bottom. It's one half of the total. And we have to balance that out with sort of this. Area here. That the pressure is acting upon. So it's just like rectangular area that would you would have if you just like sliced through the face of the cylinder. Okay. And so here the pressure sort of acting on this face is a little p. So again, we need a force balance. Okay. <clears throat> We need to assign a variable to kind of like the length of the cylinder. So let's call that L. It's going to be important for us. So as a reminder, the internal radius here is little r. And the wall thickness is little t. OK, if that's the situation, then from pressure, We have something like this little p times the area over which it acts, this sort of like blue rectangle. And that's just going to be the length times two times r. Okay. This has to balance with the force that comes from the hoop stress. 
So the area over which the hoop stress acts is like, let's do it in green, is like the wall thickness here and the wall thickness here. Okay. So this is balanced by, let's do it in black, the hoop stress times the area over which it acts, which is going to be L times 2T. Right. All right, so we're going to see some L's cancel. We're going to see some 2's cancel. And you're going to end up with an expression for the hoop stress inside of your piece, which is going to be PR on T. We'll also make a note here that the hoop stress is two times the axial stress. It's kind of a strange finding that sort of falls out from this derivation. Okay. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is sort of the radial stresses that occur both in the cylinder and in the sphere. So let's talk now about radial stresses. <clears throat> so what do I mean by that? OK. Well, for sphere, here we are with our sphere. We have an element on the surface. We know we don't have any shear that develops. And we know that this is just the axial stress, and this is just the axial stress. PR on 2T. Okay. So what is out of plane stress? And this out of plane stress we call the radial stress. Sigma R. So I'm on the surface of that cylinder. I'm in a condition of plane stress, meaning my radial stress is what? Someone in the audience. Plane stress conditions, I have zero, zero. radial stress. And that's because plane stress. I should be more clear about this. Outer surface. What about the inner surface? What's going on at the inner surface? I've got this internal pressure, right? That pressure is basically pushing right on my surface element. Okay. So in order for this thing to be in equilibrium, I've got pressure that's applied to that inner surface. In order to balance that out, my element in that radial direction has to push back with an equal amount of stress in order to be in equilibrium. So to balance, internal pressure, 
the radial stress at the inner surface is the opposite of whatever the internal pressure is. So it's negative P. Or P is the internal pressure. I have to balance out whatever you know pressure is there on the inside, sort of in this radial direction. Why is this uncomfortable? Why are we uncomfortable by this by this fact? I mean, you've sort of assumed that the wall of this sphere is thin. One side of the wall, you have zero radial pressure. The other side of the wall, you have some negative, you know, pressure from the internal cylinder that you have to balance out. This is not what actually happens in reality, okay? You cannot have some thin element where you're not balanced in equilibrium on either side, okay? One side has zero radial pressure, we're assuming. One side has some negative internal pressure. It's not really what happens, okay? In reality, <clears throat> sort of here is like the wall of your cylinder, okay? Even if it is thin. All right, on the inside, you got all this pressure like bearing down on your wall, right? So on the inside here, we sort of like plot what the radial stress might look like. You've got to balance out that pressure on the internal surface, okay? So there's some value here. I'm going to kind of like make a graphic. At this location, sigma r is negative p. At this location, sigma r is zero on the outer edge, okay? We don't have any pressure on the outside of the cylinder. So we're basically balanced, which is zero, okay? So the distribution of a stress looks actually in reality something like this, okay? Or if you think of this as like some graphical representation of the magnitude of the radial stress going from the internal to the outer wall, that's what it would look like, okay? If we assume that it is thin, we don't have this thickness, okay? This is why it's uncomfortable. Because if thin, you've assumed the wall looks like this, okay? And if the wall looks like this, you're saying on either side of this wall, you have various values of the radial stress, okay? So how can you simultaneously have this value as negative P and this value as zero? This is a problem with this theory, okay? If you've assumed that the wall is thin, you're assuming that Basically, the radial stress is the same value, but different values, but you're thin and it, OK, bad. Okay, this is not a good theory. OK, so because of this, usually radial stress not well represented. with thin wall theory. For cylinders and spheres. OK. <clears throat> but if we had to summarize. Your axial stress for a sear, PR on 2T. Your hoop stress for a sphere, which is the same as the axial stress, PR on 2T. And your radial stress equals zero at surface, sort of the outer surface. And your radial stress 
negative internal pressure at inner surface. For cylinder, your axial stress is still PR on 2T. Your hoop stress is different than the axial stress. It's actually two times the axial stress. It's PR on T. And you have the similar thing going on for the radial stress, which is sort of this autoplane stress. It's zero at the outer surface. And it's equal to the negative internal pressure at the inner surface. What's the radial stress somewhere in between the outer and the inner wall? Who knows? This is your sort of thin wall theory. Sparkles. OK, let's do an example problem. Uh, one final note. Since no shear stress, these stresses are principal. Usually, the conditions are the axial stress is. Well, let me make sure I get this right. Just to get them in the right order. Usually the axial stress is sigma 2. The hoop stress is sigma 1. And the radial stress is sigma 3. Usually. This would be the case for positive internal pressure. For negative internal pressure, not quite right, but there you go. All right, let's do an example. Should be a quick one. So raining. Okay. Here's a spherical gas tank. It's been fabricated by bolting two hemispherical shells together. So there's an internal pressure to MPA. We want to determine the normal stress developed in the walls of the vessel and in each of the bolts that is sort of holding this thing together. Interesting. Tank has an inner diameter of eight meters and it's sealed with 900 bolts. 900, dang. That's more than I got at my house. Each one of those bolts is 25 millimeters in diameter. All right, I'll give you a second and then we'll work through it. If you've been sitting on a mail-in ballot, basically today's the day. Today or bust, by the way. I think yesterday was the recommended day. So that it would get to where it needs to go by election day. Just throwing that one out there. Nine hundred day. Imagine being that guy that has to like secure all nine hundred bolts. Oh, and by guy I mean some machine is obviously doing that. <laughs> Imagine being that machine. You go on strike. I'm just kidding. I demand a raise. Give me better oil. 
We will unionize. OK. So here we go with our example problem. I'll bring in the picture. The relevant information in here and then we'll work through it. This one should go pretty quickly. So we got the spherical gas tank here. Internal pressure, we're using the variable little p, it's 2 MPa. All right, our wall thickness, 30 millimeters. The internal diameter we're given, um, 8 meters. That means my internal radius is 4 meters. And this basically all has to do with the, uh, the cylinder. And then there's number of bolts, it's 900. And the diameter of each bolt is 25 millimeters. So we want to find stress in the walls. So that's the axial stress. And we also want to find um, the stress in each of the bolts. So let's call that sigma B, stress in bolts. All right, so the idea is we're basically going to like cut through the cylinder with this sort of plane. And I'm going to sort of draw a two dimensional version of this sort of like looking on this particular cylinder. All right, so I'll kind of just draw like one half. Right. So that's going to look something like this. If I'm just like looking at it head on. And the idea is I'm going to do a force balance kind of in like this Y direction. If I call this like Y, I'm going to do a force balance in the Y direction. Right. Obviously, the force from the pressure is going to be here, and that's going to be equal to the area that we have on this sort of bottom surface of this half of this of the sphere multiplied by the pressure that's that's there. So here, this is going to be something like pi r squared times little p. That's the force that's developing generally on that sort of open face. That has to be balanced by the forces of all of the bolts. OK, that's really what we're interested in here. Um, so we're going to balance this with these two arrows. And I'll say this is 450 times the force of the bolt. This is 450 times the force of the bolt. Right. That's kind of like a free body diagram that we have. This is kind of like the free body diagram for the for the problem here to sort of figure out what the forces are in the bolts. So let's sort of execute that portion of it. So we'll have 900 times the force in the bolt equal to this force that's coming from the internal pressure, which is pi r squared times little p. Nine hundred times force in the bolt is pi times the radius is four meters squared times the internal pressure, which you're given as two MPa. Or you can determine that the force in each particular bolt it's going to be 112 kPa. This is in each bolt. kPa, no, kilonewtons. Sorry about that. This is a force, kilonewtons. So if that's the force in each bolt, then you can sort of think about the stress that's going to be uh, enacted in each one of these bolts as well, uh, just by dividing this force by the area of each bolt. So stress in bolt is um, the force in each bolt divided by the area of the bolt. So the force in each bolt, 112 kilonewtons, divided by the area of the bolt, 
This is going to be um, pi times, we're given the diameter of the bolt, so I'll give d bolt on 2 squared, <clears throat> where the diameter of the bolt we know is 25 millimeters. So you punch that in. You get the stress in each bolt here, 228 MPa, which is quite high. Right. So those are the stresses that develop in each bolt. Last thing that we want to determine in this problem is the stresses in the wall of the cylinder. Cylinder. God. Ah, sphere, sphere, sphere. Nothing to sphere but sphere itself. Okay. So finally, save the easy bit for last. Oh, sphere. Ah. RAR, SPHERE. Well, we know from our derivation that we did that the axial stress here in the walls of the sphere, PR on 2T. Here, this is 2 MPa multiplied by the radius of our sphere. This is the internal radius of the sphere. Okay, keep that in mind. This is how our derivation was done, right, on that internal area, which uses the internal radius. This is going to be 4 meters. divided by two times the wall thickness. We are told is 30 millimeters, so that's 0 0.3 meters. Work all this out, and you'll get the stresses in the wall, 133 MPa. So that's the actual stress in the wall of the sphere. OK, baby, two minutes to spare. Any questions? Okay, that'll be it for today. We'll do thick walled on Friday. So long. <laughs>